Okay, so fortunately, uh, one of my colleagues is not able to make it. Um, so I'm also going to be talking with my colleague, Renee, uh, on her talk, uh, Maps for Maneuvers. So uh, Yan Yan was meant to be giving the talk today, but uh, yeah, she couldn't make it. So instead, we're going we're gonna to do our best to deliver this talk. So bear with us. As you know by now, we're from Lyft, and our mission is to, provide, uh, to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. Um, <clears throat> And increasingly at Lyft, um, that has uh, sort of broadened in definition. So I think probably everyone's aware that Lyft is a ride-hailing service, or is its first um, sort of uh, business. And so that's all about cars, but also to a great extent pedestrians, because most riders, before they get in the car, are pedestrians. Uh, but we're also trying to um, expand the definition of um, what Lyft can provide for, for transport. So linking up to transit, uh, making good relationships with, with cities and with transit authorities to provide those kind of last mile um, bits of, of transportation. And also uh, bikes and scooters as well now, uh, a recent sort of departure for us. But so lots of new modes of transport uh, that hopefully all together can combine for riders to have the best possible transportation experience. So uh, just speaking about the off-road problem, um, but we observe like a, wi a wide range of, of movement now on the platform, so and increasingly more and more from, from different modes. So talked about map matching when the map was wrong, but that kind of presupposed that we were dealing with cars that were driving on roads, and that when we saw them not apparently driving on roads, that was because there was some sort of issue with the map, or not necessarily with the map, but our interpretation of the map. Um, but as we think about other transportation modes, like bikes, scooters, pedestrians, um, it's not at all clear what... Um, sort of moving not on roads means. Uh, it's, it's completely reasonable for things like a bicycle um, to be on a pavement or to be cycling across a park where a car couldn't get to. So these new modes of transport have uh, their own regulations, and they also have their own abilities to travel in areas that previously we wouldn't have expected to, to see cars in. Um, and different modes of transport may have different uh, like places that they can go. So, for example, if it's a dense or relatively densely wooded area, you may be able to walk through it as a pedestrian, but uh, maybe a bicycle wouldn't be able to, to go there. So we also want to think about how to connect these things up um, in order to make a good experience for, for passengers. When we're thinking about these multimodal trips now that we're, we're trying to provide, how do we uh, recommend people connect these, these types of transportation? So the first sort of way that we've started to think about that um, is even with, with like walking directions for a pedestrian to, um, to the car, to the pickup point. Um, and walking directions have a whole bunch of different requirements to driving directions, you know, because we don't want to route people down a freeway. We don't want to make them walk on the center of a split carriageway road. And you know maybe we want to give them um, walking routes which are nice, which have fewer road crossings. We don't want to ask them to jaywalk if that's illegal or dangerous. Um, so there's, there's additional considerations that we want, to, um, we want to deal with when we're dealing with walking directions. And <clears throat> so one of the questions is how um, I have no answer for this question. This is a question uh, for OSM and the OSM community, really. Is like how, how can we encode the things that we need for, for these kinds of problems into OSM? Uh, how do we use OSM to, to solve this kind of problem? And like, is the, is the more that we, we need to do to sort of make this applicable to all of these different modes, and particularly the ways in which they connect up with each other? Uh, because there's things like, links where, you know, do you need to encode places where, for example, um, you can switch between modes of transport? 
So some of these things are clearly not mapping issues. They're, they're clearly something to do with like, the way in which we use uh, these different services and the, the restrictions that are placed on them. But in other, other times, you know, maybe these are things which are kind of uh, based on the geography or some kind of mappable uh, like quality of, of space, the space itself. So I'll hand over to Renee to talk about some use cases. Thanks, James. Um, so some use cases. We have a, uh, as James referred to, uh, a number of different use cases that, that apply across different transportation modes um, and, and challenges. One area of challenges are parking lots, uh, which are where rides often begin and end. In parking lots, there's a lot of unmapped areas. They frequently are unmapped, and so when cars enter those parking lots, uh, we end up incorrectly map matching your location or a passenger's location or a driver's location to the nearest main road instead of matching it to somewhere inside the parking lot. And uh, this shows an example, for example, uh, in a shopping mall in New York, which was, has a very large parking lot, and we've uh, managed to map match it incorrectly to the nearest road. Parking lots are also challenging because the movement that drivers take in parking lots is not always consistent and not always in the lanes. Cars don't always follow the lanes, especially if there aren't other cars, vehicles parked uh, in the parking spots. So they can cut across an empty lot, and in which case, if we're using map matching and looking at road segments, we end up uh, incorrectly uh, map matching where the driver actually traveled. And then this has also um, been referenced earlier, but we have a lot of stacked garages, which are also parking lots, and they can have different layouts, uh, different traffic patterns. They're not always consistent from location to location. Uh, and this is an image of, for example, the um, San Francisco Airport domestic terminal garage. So this one's a bit circular, uh, and the rows of the parking spots are not all parallel to each other. Another uh, area of challenges that we have are intersections. And within intersections, what you'll see here is that in OSM, you see dedicated turning lanes, uh, which assume a certain road geometry and assume that drivers will follow those lanes. Drivers fre frequently cut corners, and uh, even though there are dedicated turning lanes, and here you'll see it's marked in red, um, drivers don't always follow those directions. And when we map match then to how it's, um, how it's uh, set up in OSM, we end up calculating the wrong distance, for example, which is something that is, uh, something that our business relies on because pricing, for example, relies on time and distance, distance measurements and estimates. Large intersections have similar problems um, where if drivers cut corners, then we don't accurately uh, measure the distance traveled. When you have multiple lanes, if you're going from the nearest lane versus the furthest lane and uh, turning at that intersection. This can actually lead to errors on the order of several lanes, which can be up to 20 meters. And that's fairly significant when you're talking about the total distance traveled. Um, you know, that can add up in terms of percentage of the total distance traveled. Another area uh, are unconstrained traffic movements. So you're going to see a pattern here where uh, folk, the drivers don't always match the uh, movement of what is mapped on the underlying map. So here, drivers, in this uh, example, drivers will cross over double-painted yellow lines, for example. That's an illegal movement, um, and when we map match, we follow the rules of the law, <laughs> but not all drivers do. And so when a driver makes an illegal turn and crosses painted lines, perhaps to pick up a passenger, passenger on the other side of the street, um, and this example is from Nashville, Tennessee, you'll see that we map match incorrectly and may map match them a much longer route 
um, to all the way to the end of the road where they can do a legal U-turn instead. And that adds distance or um, just overall makes our distance calculations incorrect. We also see a lot of unconstrained movements in open spaces, large um, turnabouts where cars can move around, back up, uh, make non-regular movements. Uh, and in this example, you'll see that on OSM, circled in pink, uh, we have the walking path to the open lot uh, connected, but drivers are not necessarily following that exact path. They may be driving around that open lot. Also of note, parking lots and pedestrian lanes fall in this category. So we have a lot of challenges in terms of where actual physical movement occurs versus where, uh, what is on the underlying map. Um, and then overall, another challenge is that the movement of cars is very different than the movement of other multimodal, uh, what we call location producing devices, for example. So in cars, again, movements can change based off of um, where you are between parking lots, airports, intersections. Uh, it also changes, depends on the driver. Some drivers are very cautious and follow all legal guidance and do not cross double yellow lines. Other areas um, of challenge are curbs. So pedestrian walkways, in this example, you'll see that the walkway is accurate, but does not connect to where a passenger would actually get picked up. So when we are mapping here where the pedestrian is actually moving when they're walking, we don't capture that they walk all the way to the edge of the road where they might be picked up. So we have a lot of challenges with sidewalks that are not connected to road segments where we're not capturing where the passenger may actually be moving to. Another area is transit. Transit stations, so bus terminals, train stations, often have different movement patterns within waiting areas, station maps, uh, connections, designated ride sharing spots. And so this is a whole other area of challenges for us. And then last, bikes and scooters. Uh, bikes and scooters are allowed sometimes on roads, sometimes not sometimes on bike lanes, sometimes not, sometimes sidewalks. It really depends on the city and local regulations as well. And also sometimes have predetermined docking stations that can be on a sidewalk. So they go on and off road. Uh, and this is a whole other area of challenge when you're thinking of map matching and understanding the road network underneath that we are mapping movements to and, and GPS signals. So in summary, you'll see that um, across these multimodal uh, movements or types of transportation, there are different requirements. So cars, we really want lane level accuracy, right? Typically, that's around five meters in accuracy. For pedestrians, you're talking about more, more like one meter level accuracy. Transit, probably around 10 meters. We just want to know where you are relative to what train you might be catching. And then bikes and scooters are more like pedestrian movements where we want one meter level accuracy based off of how uh, you travel, the space within that you travel as well. And then the permitted zones vary as well between cars, pedestrians, transit, bikes, and scooters. Um, you know, cars are usually on roads and then off-road areas like parking lots. But generally, you know, they're not uh, moving onto sidewalks. Pedestrians, you get into the challenge of they're moving on sidewalks, curbs, they're usually indoors, and then they can also move on roads um, when they're crossing a road, for example. Transit, you have specific transit lines that now you have to take into consideration, and sometimes roads as well, and specific lanes when you're talking about buses. Bikes and scooters move on and off sidewalks, bike lanes, sometimes roads. Um, and then the last row here is just sort of summarizing the types of move movements that you might have to capture in terms of transitions between road, off-road, um, moving out of a vehicle, and then becoming a pedestrian, uh, et cetera. So I am going to speed up here because we just got 
Um, so overall, we're looking for feedback on approaches to solve these use cases. We do not have solutions to all of these problems. This is a summary of, of the problems and challenges we have as we start to look at a multimodal space. Um, and w what we do have is a lot of detected behavior and we can contribute this back. Um, obviously, not all problems can be solved with improved maps, but uh, we can capture these spatial relationships. So here are some, James is going to take over and uh, discuss some mapping approaches. Yeah, so um, obviously not all of this we can solve with a mapping approach. Um, lots of things uh, we have to deal with, um, so with algorithms on top of the maps. Um, but <clears throat> we have these open areas of, of the road network or like perhaps sidewalks, things like that. Uh, how do we know when um, and where these um, vehicles, people from different modes of, of transit can go? Is there something we can do with the existing map which lets us kind of mark these areas as, for example, travelable by bikes and scooters, maybe a bike lane at the side of a road, um, and then an area which is sort of able to be traveled by pedestrians. But these are not because of the sort of flexibility of these types of transit, and pedestrians in particular, they're not hard constraints. They can almost, you know, we can never really have them as hard constraints. We just want to say these are areas where we're much more likely to see uh, these, these types of vehicles. These are areas where, um, you know, maybe these vehicles are permitted. But that doesn't mean because people, particularly with things like bikes and scooters, uh, maybe don't follow traffic regulations as, as strictly as they do in cars. Uh, we have to also have algorithms which are robust to um, kind of behavior which is not captured in the map and which we can never capture in the map. Um, so yeah, uh, we, we don't really have a sort of a, a good solution to this. We uh, you know, would be very interested to hear sort of ideas from the community on how we should deal with, with this kind of problem, like how we can encode that information about what areas are kind of traversable different ways um, by different vehicles and as well also uh, places where you know maybe those those types of tr transit link up with each other so for example bikes that have to have docking stations so um, <clears throat> obviously like a, a mapping solution is not possible for everything uh, probably also we need to have different sort of robust algorithms that are built on top of these maps so in order to apply that, um, it's, it's kind of useful to have some sort of standard encoding or some sort of standard treatment of, of these kinds of things. Um, so again, yeah, we don't know what that should be, but uh, it's something that would be, will be very helpful for us. Because um, then once it's sort of defined, you can define algorithms on it like nearest. You know, for example, like the very simplest form of map matching is the, what's the nearest point on the, the road network, say. So for a car, that's pretty easily defined, okay. And uh, on the other hand, for things like pedestrians, bikes, scooters, it's much more difficult because nearest, maybe on a road for a bicycle, should actually, or near a road, should actually be the road. But on the other hand, in a, a park, it, it, like the, bike, the bike can travel freely there. Similarly, for, for map matching, um, we have to think about um, things like transition costs between different modes. If you're thinking about these multimodal trips, um, what are the different sort of times and transition probabilities between the different modes and how are they constrained? Um, and then also is there some kind of uh, robustness that's necessary to deal with the difference between what's legal and what's actually physically possible in real life? And similarly for routing, the problem is sort of complicated by having all of these additional modes. Um, it's much more computationally expensive because you have to consider all of these different possible ways of completing a, a trip. Um, and each of them has different constraints, different mobility, different speeds. Um, and you, know, you may want to optimize for different factors. So maybe cost, maybe travel time, depending on the objectives of the, of the rider. So yeah, in conclusion, um, we would very much like to enhance our approaches uh, around uh, multimodal transportation. And I think that maps are probably an important part of that. Exactly how they, they fit in and how 
that interaction between maps and algorithms that are built on top of them works is still an open question for us. And yeah, we're, we're just very interested in hearing opinions around that. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, I think that's yeah. In particular, just sort of de dealing with multimodal trans um, yeah transportation is kind of the main the main challenge. Um, but yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so uh, it's, yeah, we would like to do that. It's more complicated, obviously, because things like where the sidewalk is in comparison to the, the road depends on things like the road width. If there is a sidewalk at the side of, of a, a road, you know, encoding all of that information. Um, so it's more complicated, but it's useful because, yeah, it's right. It can be the difference between a pedestrian being inside a building or outside a building. So it's, it's helpful. Uh, yeah. Have you guys put any? This day? Yeah, I think that I mean those kinds of elements I think would be would be very useful for us. I think this is the kind of thing that we want to figure out how to incorporate those into things like the algorithms that are built on top of that. Like how should we interact with them? How are they applied throughout the map? Is that is that kind of consistent? Can we re sort of rely on that behavior being the same everywhere? Um, yeah, these are these are kind of open questions for us. So. Yeah. I think they're also, um there are also elements that OSM does not have today, and so that is of interest if the community is also open to including elements like that in the map. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's very it's interesting, great. yeah. Um, I, I think things like, you know, getting the, the routing really good between all of these modes is very important. So having maps which really reflect how these things can connect up and, yeah. and where they connect up. And, and the kind of different routing considerations that are important for each of these different modes and encoding that somehow is, is you know, pretty important, pretty useful. I think, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see more of that. Like, I think that we've already tried to but walking directions in there, and actually, that's there's a whole bunch of challenges around that, which uh, you know, so it, it's more more difficult than uh, you first think, which is just apply routing on the road network, which doesn't really work. Um, and so one yeah. of the sections we spoke about was transition points, and those have not been a focus area of getting very very accurate in the past, I think. Um, but as we're starting to think about you know multimodal last mile, you need those transition points to be connected to be accurate and exist as yeah. well. And in fact, we're already seeing things like, uh, I mean, curbs, pick up points on curbs is, is kind of the start of, of that sort of um, like geographic element which defines how these, element, like these transit modes link up, I guess. Okay, oh, sorry. When you say transition points, are you No, I, I think, no, just, just more like the, the places where you can change uh, from mode to mode. Um, yeah. I, but yeah, the disconnected possession stuff is important as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you.